run. <laughs> okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to possibly the most important hour of your lives. <laughs> I love that part. Awesomeness, yes! Today, we are going to quantify the unquantifiable. <coughs> we are going to look at all those things that judges never admit to. We're going to deal with this idea that human beings, as much as we care about them, are never rational. But we consistently rationalize things. We make up reasons why things matter. When in truth, we've already made that decision. Right here. And that is what really is. I'm going to talk to you ladies and gentlemen today about the one thing no judge ever concedes that they judge upon. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the practice of the grand rhetor, as the ancient Greeks would have it. The public speaker who uses his logos, his pathos, and his ethos in order to make you believe that what he says is true. Style is an unfashionable word which seems strange when you consider it. Because fashion is almost never stylish. But style is never out of fashion. Okay? So how do we promote our ideas in the best way possible? How do we use the God-given skills we have in order to make ourselves more persuasive, more enjoyable to listen to in order to overcome what is known in communication as the rule of three. For those of you that don't know the rule of three, I'm going to outline it right here and right now. The rule of three is very simple. One third of what you say is never heard. One third of what is heard is never listened to. One third of what is listened to will never be understood. We're going to talk about how you can overcome those hurdles that are natural and ingrained in every audience. And if I have time, at the end, I'm going to teach every single one of you rocket science. <laughs> and I'm going to do so in under three minutes. Anybody here want to bet me that I can't? Ooh, good. Yeah. You're all awake. Firstly, I apologize for my timekeeping. As one of the most wonderful human beings on the face of this planet, a guy you may know well called Dr. Alfred Schneider, once said, the world is run by people who show up on time. I was once told when I was working as a freelance journalist, and this is a crying, crying shame, and somebody actually felt the need to say this to me. Radian, we consider you one of our best freelancers because whatever we ask you to do, you are there with a pen and a piece of paper. Most people forget even the most basic elements of what is required for their job. Most public speakers, and in this I include your lecturers, not from the idols, obviously, because they are all brilliant. <coughs> your lecturers in college very often forget that their job is not to stand at the front of the stage and go, look at me, I have knowledge. Their job is to impart that knowledge in the best way possible. And very few of them ever do it. Think back to your best high school teacher. I guarantee you, it wasn't the person who knew the most. But the person who could get you to understand the most by using simple, everyday terms to explain very complex ideas, by being open about their communication, by drawing you in to their world, by making you listen to them. 
And there are some key areas that we can all work on in order to make ourselves more persuasive, more likable as public speakers. So that's going to be the focus of today's lecture. We're going to look at the voice as a tool, because it's about the only tool you've got in your public speaking. We're going to look at the importance of making yourself pleasant to listen to. Lastly, we're going to look at ideas that we've talked about already, the importance of structure, analysis, examples that work, and linking these back to our original premise. <coughs> So let's deal with the first, the voice. Now, some of you will have heard that the voice is not much you can do something about. That what you have is your natural voice. Have you ever studied any theater? Put your hands right up so I can see them. There we go. How many of those? Theatrical people believe that you cannot change your natural voice. Not a one, ladies and gentlemen. Actors change their voice all the time. How do they do it? They learn to control their breathing and therefore modulate how sounds are created. The only way you can create sound, I'm going to ask you all to stand up in a second to so be ready. The only way you can modulate sound is by controlling your breathing. Everybody stand. <coughs> I want you to do two things for me. I want you to breathe out all the air in your lungs, first of all, and not breathe in afterwards, okay? So I want you all to breathe out now, and then speak. It's really hard, isn't it? <laughs> really, really hard. It's okay, you can see. That is because the only way human beings have ever found of creating sound, apart from <coughs> smashing plates or banging rocks together, the only way we have internally of creating sound is by pushing it up across our vocal cords, causing them to vibrate. That is what sound in a human context is. If you are breathing out, it is almost impossible to speak. There is only one nation on earth I know of that can do it regularly, breathe in and speak at the same time. The Finns are a very strange people <laughs> and are almost a model for nothing. As Bertolt Brecht once said, they are a bilingual people yet silent in both languages. But because of the peculiar way of the way the Finnish language is formed, they seem not to require the same elation, the same pushing forward of breath across the vocal cords. Every other language in the world requires it, and it is something that you must get used to, because there is nothing worse than a great public speaker getting almost to the point he wants to make and then <gasps> breathing in because he cannot finish it. Imagine Luciano Pavarotti singing Nessun Dorma. And then imagine him breathing in in the middle of a line in the aria. Imagine the effect that that would have. And I don't propose to sing it accurately, particularly not this morning after the exertions of last night. <laughs> but just imagine what would happen if standing in La Scala in Milan, we heard Nessun <gasps> Dorma. Slightly jarring effect, I think. When you are speaking in public, whether it could be a debate or a presentation or anything else, Focus on the idea that you control your breathing. You can measure the explanation of that air. Again, everybody rise. We're going to practice breathing right now. 
because it's something so many people forget that they are doing. For those of you that are interested in the psychology of it, this is because there are three types of memory. There is active memory, that is memory that we are conscious of using. When you ask me to remember what happened on Monday, even if I can't remember accurately, I am still using my active memory. I go back into the database or file store and I start to pull out various bits of information. There is unconscious memory, which I hope most of you used this morning when you woke up and you brushed your teeth. You didn't stand there thinking, hmm, how do I brush my teeth? Well, I've got to go this way and this way and up and down and I've got to rinse. They are behaviours that are so ingrained that it becomes unconscious. And there is a third type of memory, which we will get on to later. But the fact is that breathing is something we, we all have to learn to do. There's a reason you get smacked on the bottom by the midwife when you're born. To encourage your lungs to open and that intake of air to happen. You consciously or unconsciously remember each time you breathe in what you were doing and what you're doing when you breathe out. But so rarely do we ever concentrate on it that we are able to concentrate our energy just on our breathing. Where should you breathe from, ladies and gentlemen? Diaphragm. Diaphragm. <coughs> right there. Not from here. And you certainly shouldn't speak from here. When that happens, your voice becomes thin, becomes reedy, becomes difficult to <coughs> project. The <laughs> diaphragm is essential for the grand rattle. If any of you ever go to the ancient sites in Athens and in Rome, you'll understand how difficult it is to make yourself heard when the wind is blowing and there's a crowd. They used to march into the ocean and have somebody stand on the beach and attempt to be heard over the waves. But there is a great difference between projecting your voice so that it is heard as far as possible and shouting. Shouting is almost never persuasive because it is almost always aggressive. <clears throat> but projection simply means that your words are carried far and wide. So we're going to practice now this element of breathing. <clears throat> when I raise my arm like this, I want you all to breathe in through your noses as deeply as you can. When I drop my arm, I want you to release that breath. <coughs> Not in one great exhalation, but modulated. I want you to release that breath on a note. Don't worry, I'm not going to come around and judge whether I can match my tuning fork to you, because let's face it, I couldn't do that right now. <coughs> but what I am going to ask you to do is control the flow of that breath so that you can sustain whatever note it is you choose for as long as possible. Are we ready? <clears throat> Breathe in. And out. Stop making noise, sit down. <laughs> How many of you found when you got towards the end the notes started to go uh, 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 as you force more and more breath out of your lungs? The same applies in speech. You need to moderate your breath in order to get to the end of your sentence without having to artificially break it up with another breath. This is important because human beings listen to words in blocks. We don't listen to what you say very often. Remember, 
One third of what is said is never heard. One third of what is heard is never listened to. The importance is to make sure you can overcome that. And the way you can overcome that, the easiest way you can overcome that, is by controlling your breathing to such a degree that you are able to finish each and every phrase, each and every sentence, without going, <gasps> and there's the end. <coughs> Why is this important? This is important for our natural understanding of things. Let's take, for example, a passage from Shakespeare, which you may have come across. I think it's quite famous. <coughs> it starts off, to be or not to be. Anybody ever heard of that speech? In the grand scheme of things, I think it's something that most people <coughs> at some point encounter. If we say it without any pausing or breathing, it becomes almost incomprehensible as to what is the true meaning. To be or not to be, that is the question. And it's no good mind suffering, sings and arrows about rage of fortune, or to take arms against sea of troubles and by opposing end them to die, to embark at sleep, my sleep to save the end of trouble, sound and shocks of the flesh, is natural air to the earth, is consummation of bad news. Oh, so, um, to I sleep, sleep, which I was dreaming, now there's a bad thing, that sleep, but who knows what shipping was come when we shuffle on this molten coil, etc., etc. It's gibberish. Shakespeare didn't know what he was on about, clearly. And yet, when we approach it on the level of an actor, and we approach it on the level of iambic pentameter, of there being a natural meter within the language that tells us which words to stress, and it also, very, very thankfully, tells us how to breathe. Shakespeare was very good at that, because Shakespeare never wrote things down. Do you know that? Not a single word of Shakespeare's plays did he write down. The first folio, the Porto edition of 1616, Shakespeare had no hand in drafting. It was written by his stage manager. Because Shakespeare couldn't write that well. His handwriting, if you've ever seen his signature, was appalling. Nobody could be expected to read that. So he used to teach his actors by rote, by getting them to repeat the lines. That was the only way he could do it. And it was the stagehand during the period 1606 to 1616 that would furiously scribble down what it was the actors were saying. The importance of this is that your breathing makes your language more understandable. It's verbal punctuation, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, it's the only reason that punctuation exists. Punctuation are marks telling you where to stop and where to breathe. Who here has ever heard the phrase, yes, we can? <laughs> <laughs> Who here has ever seen it written down with three full stops? Now, in the strict rules of linguistics, yes, we can is not three separate sentences. <coughs> but those four stops simply denote the length of the pause that our president-elect Obama chooses to give because they give weight themselves to the words. They make the words more meaningful and therefore, on some psychological levels, more understandable. Let's look again at what Shakespeare asks the young prince of Denmark to say. To be or not to be, that is the question. <coughs> whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. To die. To sleep and by a sleep to save the end of thousand shots, the freshest natural air to, which is consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep a chance to dream, aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, who knows what dream shall come? When we shuffle off this mortal coil, suddenly we gain a better understanding of what Prince Hal is trying to say. Because the actor can use those pauses to break things down for us, to 
convinces of the truth of his words. Pauses are almost more important than words in speech. The silences matter. <coughs> But Shakespeare is saying in that speech, which is in no way apparent when you read it straight through as fast as you can, and which becomes very, very clear when you adopt the natural rhythm of the text, is, should I kill myself? Should I not? To be or not to be? The most essential question he can ask. Does his inaction make him a more worthy person because it's deliberation and contemplation? Or does it in fact harm him? Because he is no longer human. Because he resists the impulse. That meaning only becomes apparent when we embrace the text in its fullest context. That means looking at the way Shakespeare punctuates things in order to further our understand. And let's face it, Shakespeare was writing for a pretty ignorant lot. I don't mean the common people down in the pit at the Globe Theatre. I mean the Royal Family of England. These people needed things spelling out to them. So practice your breathing, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to be a great speaker, practice what the great speakers do. Control that explanation of breath. Allow it to flow mellifluously. It's a wonderful word, mellifluously. In fact, it's so wonderful, I'm going to say it a third time. Mellifluously. Over your vocal cords. Allow it to enrich the sounds that you make. Why is this important? Why do we not just focus on the material that we deliver? Perquilet, possibly my second favourite of the Roman orators. And I admit that it is quite geeky to have a hierarchy of Roman orators. <laughs> but given that I'm speaking to people who give up their free time to come to debate camp, I guess I'm not alone in geekiness. <laughs> <coughs> the purple it said, and this is a quote you will find on my website if you bother to look, the advocate who seeks to persuade must first of all seek So how then do we make ourselves as likable as possible to an audience? Well, by using our voice to make it soft and modulated. Raise your hand if you attended my elective on Zen debating. Have you ever heard me speak in such a calm and rational manner? Because sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, the medium is also the message. The way you say things affects materially the impact of what you say. Never forget, it is not about the message you wish to send. Almost all public speaking is about the message that you hope is received. The only way you can ensure that people are receiving all of your message is by convincing them to listen to the sounds in the first place. Do not shout. Do not scream. That's fine for grabbing somebody's attention outside on the street. But softly spoken words are often far more acceptable Rationality comes across in the calmness of voice, in the simplicity of structure, in the idea that everything I say is well chosen and well planned. I sit here without notes, attempting to speak for almost an hour. I sit here almost without a voice, attempting to speak for almost an hour. Because I know exactly where I want to go with my speech. I know the journey on which I aim to take you. And I know the destination well. Hopefully, most if not all of you are carried along with me. Because 
We don't want to. It's a nice try when we get that. Sometimes <coughs> it is that simple. It's a matter of smiling at your audience occasionally. Because you know what happens when you smile? What happens when you smile? Smile back. People smile back. That's a wonderful thing about people. That's why babies think you're great every time you smile at them. No baby in the world is going, oh, there's Chiro, I love this guy. It's just a natural anthropological response. <laughs> Smiles make us smile. This is why they teach people in McDonald's to smile. Unfortunately, what they don't teach people in McDonald's is how to transmit a genuine emotion. <laughs> so you get people all these plastered iron grills going, have a nice day. You have a nice day. No, you have a I really couldn't care less if somebody in McDonald's thinks I'm going to have a nice day. When we lose the emotional content, the message, the message itself becomes hard to believe. Put your hand up if you believe the person last time you were in McDonald's when they said, have a nice day. Good, no one. Why not? Somebody tell me. Formulaic. Formulaic. What else? We believe someone based on what we think of the motivations behind it. Motivation is important. But also, when they said have a nice day, did you feel in any way it was actually meant for you and your day? No. As Aaliyah said, they did it like they sprinkled salt on the french fries because it was part of their job. And that comes across in the way they say it. There's no emotional content. Emotional content is one of the most important things you will never be told about in any class, apart from this one, about public speaking. Bruce Lee said it best when he said it's like a finger pointing to the moon. Why are you all looking at my finger when there's all that heavenly glory? That's what emotional content is, ladies and gentlemen. It's the ability to impart a feeling along with a word. An emotional response is what you're looking for. Because, as we know, and as Albert Camus best phrased it, human beings are not rational, they are always rationalizing. We make decisions based on our gut. We then look for reasons why our gut is right. We use backwards rationality and corroborative bias to prove hypotheses which we already believe in our own mind. I'd like you all to take a pen and a piece of paper. <coughs> I'd like you all to write down the following three numbers. Two, four, and six in that order. <coughs> Some of you may already know what I'm about to do, in which case I'd like you to keep quiet. Some of you may not know, in which case I'd like you to come. Quiet. Put your hand up if you already know what I'm going to ask you to do. Okay, so I'm focusing on quite a small number of you. Those of you that don't there is a pattern to those numbers. There is a rule. I'm not going to tell you what that rule is. I'm going to ask you now to provide me with three other numbers that conform to that rule. Go. Eight. Eight. Yes. Do you know what the rule is? No, that's not the rule, but it's a good try. Anyone else? 
Anybody else want to suggest the three number sequence that they think conforms to the rule and then tell me what the rule is? Uh, well, most obvious one is one, three, and five. Yes. Because it's adding to each successive step. That's not the rule. Anyone else? <coughs> is the rule just writing three numbers down? <coughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a good question. I want you to give me a sequence and then tell me based on the yes or no answer what the rule is. 14, 16, 18. Yes. What's the rule? The rule is three consecutive numbers, the odd number or even number, can I call the first number? No. One, two, three. Yes. Get progressively larger. There you go. See, what you all did, none of you tried to disprove the theory in your head, did you? You all looked for an answer that would get a yes and not a no. However, had anybody said three, two, one, and I'd said no, you'd know immediately what the rule is. The rule is just numbers getting bigger. Reason is, when we use our rationality, we use it in backwards ways. We form a rule in our head, and then we seek confirmative answers. We seek the yes answer, when in fact that tells us nothing. Far more instructive then to look for the negative response. That's just why our brains work in that way. But you can use that tool of persuasion, because human beings will always do that. They will always look to put a system on something and then say, this is why it works. How does that work in terms of persuasive speech? It works in terms of persuasive speech because we like to use narrative. We respond well to narrative and it conforms to the way our memory works and also the way we understand and believe things. Who here has ever read a book called the Bible? Put your hands up, where I can see. Oh, quite a few of you. Wonderful story, isn't it? To be fair, it is. It's an incredible story. And I don't use the word story in any derogatory sense. It is a great narrative. If the Bible <laughs> simply consisted of the Ten Commandments, and all the rules or commands that Jesus Christ gives Christian people, or what are then to become Christian people, do you think it would be as persuasive if it didn't construct a narrative of the life of the Messiah? Would you believe it without the construct of the story. Imagine a religious text that tells no narrative. <coughs> All it would say is, there is a being of whom I know nothing, of whom I cannot know anything because his nature is beyond knowledge. He exists outside time and space, but he's given me a set of rules to impose upon. Anybody want to buy into my religion? No. I didn't think so. I mean, it's not because I'm not inherently a guy worth worshipping. Clearly, I am. But the reason is you've given no reason. You are given no personal element that makes you want to believe. <coughs> Excuse me. The narrative construct is essential to religious belief. Without it, I could tell you that a God, of which I can conceive, is capable of doing many things, including building a stone so big that he himself cannot lift it. But that doesn't persuade in the same way as a story about a man at a wedding in Canaan, 
who, when the guest had no more wine, was able to call for water, and through a simple act of faith, turn it into wine. The narrative structure creates our desire to believe in the story. I want you to write down the following two things. Johnny seemed happily married. He killed his wife on Tuesday. I then want you to write down, Johnny seemed happily married. He killed his wife on Tuesday because he found out she'd been having an affair with the postman. I want you to look at those two constructs. And then I want you to decide which one seems more likely. Raise your hand if you think it's A. Raise your hand if you think it's B. Why do you think it's B? All I've done is limit probability. <coughs> I've given you a specific reason. And yet, you think that's a more likely thing to happen. In the construct A, could Johnny have killed his wife for money, for the inheritance? Yes. Could he have killed her by accident? Could he have killed her because he woke up one day and suddenly went insane? There are far more possible causes for Johnny killing his wife. Mm -hmm. So on a probability basis, it's far more likely to have occurred. And yet, because I gave you details and created a narrative, most of you decided that that was the more likely outcome. Mm -hmm. When all I'd done was give you one specific reason <coughs> why. Why did you do that? I'll tell you. Because human beings feel more comfortable with narrative and with more information rather than with less. Even when that information automatically excludes other possibilities. You can use narrative in your speech to make yourselves persuasive. You can construct a narrative that shows your argument works. Some of you may have read a piece I wrote about honour killing. It begins with a very, very tragic story about a young girl called Fatim, who is the son of Pakistani immigrants in Burma. Fatim was loved by her family. She was a princess to <laughs> They would do anything for her. She wasn't stupid. She knew from all the teachings she'd had that boys could be a little bit off, that they could want certain things that she wasn't prepared to give. So she was careful in her behavior. She was never forced to wear a hijab or anything like that. One day, very sadly, the team was attacked and raped. Because of that, her family, based on their culture or background or whatever, decided that she had brought shame on the family, that she herself must die. Reluctantly, one of her brothers was forced to, do, make, to kill her. That is the concept of honor if I now go on to tell you why I think honour killing is so bad, you're far more likely to believe what I'm saying because I created the emotional content of the narrative. If I just stand up and say honour killing is a bad thing, some of you may agree, some of you may think, well, it's an issue of cultural relativism. Some of you, being debaters, may say, well, I need more of an argument than that. But the fact that I've just told you about a girl who I could have made up <coughs> means that when I go into my argument, you are much more ready to believe what I'm saying. I've primed you with my narrative. I've prepared you for the <coughs> argumentation to come. The story about Fatim tells you nothing. Or does it? Look at the words that were used. 
the team was a princess to her family. I'm creating an idea around this perhaps fictional person. I'm getting you to see this person as a real thing. I'm asking you, I'm begging of you, that you emotionally invest in what I am saying. Very few people can hear a tale of murder and not be moved by it. Put your hand up if you weren't moved by my little tale of the team. Thankfully, no one. Because you were moved by it, any argument I choose to predicate upon it becomes more likely, becomes more believable. The crucial thing is, you yourself are more willing to believe before I've even begun to make that argument. That is one way in which humans invest in stories. We invest emotionally and then when stories become argumentation, it's very, very hard to remove ourselves from that emotional link. The words you use do matter. The words you use matter incredibly, but not in what they describe. Tyler, you have a question. Is, is the logic that's provided after the narrative just the justification to succeed into that emotive state? What do we think? The argument we make afterwards is more accessible because of the narrative. It's not merely justification. The argument itself must be sound. If I tell you a wonderful narrative about the team and then say, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the sky is green, how many of you will believe me? That's because there's no connection between the, like, that emotive state that you put them in and your actual exactly. The narrative has to link in some way to the point you are trying to make. The point you are trying to make must itself be a reasonable argument, and one that we are willing to believe. But our capacity for belief is increased by the narrative structure. We are much more willing to believe stories than we like to admit. <coughs> so persuasive is the fact that we hear stories from what we are born, which means that they form incredible connections in our brain. And then when you hear a story, you open a much, much bigger part of your brain, you access it. So after that, when you hear the argument, the argument gets linked to much more neural networks, which makes it more persuasive. Absolutely. Stories are all human beings had in the beginning. Before we ever learn how to write, we told stories. We told stories in the oral tradition. We handed them down by word of mouth. China, up until the 6th century AD, had no uniform script. It was imposed upon them by the Jin Dynasty, spelled Q-I-N for those of you who are interested in phonetic representations of other languages. <coughs> Miss Gold. Miss Gold. Hmm? Miss Gold. Jim Miss Gold. Yeah. There was an area of China at the time that specialized in calligraphy. They were considered the best calligraphers. And the first Qing dynasty decided that that should be the uniform script. <laughs> now, in a place as large as China, that's incredibly important. If you're able to write things down in a way that everybody over your territory can understand them. But stories form part of our anthropological history. Every culture has a creation myth. They never ever try to posit God or Allah or Yahweh or whatever you want to call him in logical terms. Descartes tries and fails miserably because it's almost impossible to engender belief to 
neurological structure. Who here has strongly held religious beliefs? Put your hands up. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to judge you for them. Okay. How easy is it to convince people of your religious beliefs on a rational, logical basis? Impossible. Impossible. That's how easy it is. It's impossible. <coughs> Belief is not a rational thing. Faith is itself illogical. So you cannot prove the existence of a faith-based creation or a faith-based being on logic. We need to weave a, a narrative around it. We need to impress people with tales of what was done in his or her name or things that his or her son may have done. I'm hedging my bets here. Because I honestly don't know if there's a God or not. One of my favourite pieces of graffiti said, God is black, yes she is. I think that's interesting. I don't think it's true. I'm not saying that God isn't black. I'm saying that very often as humans, we ascribe our own qualities onto our deities. It's a myth that God created man in his or her own image. It's the other way around. Man always constructs God in his own image. Very, very few people, if they believe, conceive of a God who looks markedly different to them. The God of the Christian world, how do we picture him, even if we're not religious? Like man. Rather like man. <laughs> <laughs> Old, wise, his big beard. Everybody recognise that image? Put on white flowing robes, long hair, arms outstretched. That's pretty much your image of a Christian God. Certainly if you believe films like The Ten Commandments. Difficult though to construct an image in a religion that bans imagery. There is no conceivable picture of Allah. Although, I'm prepared to posit that if it were allowed by the religion of Islam, he might look a bit like a Muslim. <laughs> Buddha, bizarrely, despite the fact that we know that the Buddha was born in India, in our characterizations of him, looks as though he's from where? China, or Southeast Asia, generally. Why? Because that's where Buddhism holds most sway. The Hindu god gods, Kali, Shiva, all have a vaguely Indian in the formation of their eyes and their hands. <coughs> it seems interesting then that we choose to impose our own image onto these narrative constructs. Why do we do this? Because it makes us more ready to believe. The psychology of persuasion is this state. People like people who they think are like them. But does that really have to do with belief, or does it really more have to do with external validation? Which do we think? We believe, because... <laughs> does it matter whether it's belief or external validation? The fact is, we respond more easily to the image that we find familiar. And that is the point. When we create the familiar, we're more likely to buy into it. People like people, they think are like them. On a basic level. Who here believes that all babies are racists? They are. Nobody put their hand up, but they are. 
All babies are racist. Did you know that? I can prove it to you. I can't prove it to you right now because unfortunately Tuna won't let me keep babies uh, like that. <laughs> he told me they'd stop me at the border if I tried to bring them in in my hold luggage. But if you put two babies in a room and take away their parents, two babies of different skin color, take away their parents and put two complete strangers in the room, but who also happen to have the skin color of one or other baby, the babies will naturally crawl to the person with the same skin color. The black child will crawl to the black person, even though they don't know them. The white child <coughs> will crawl to the white person. All babies are racist, ignorant morons. No. They just feel comfortable responding to the familiar. Because of that, we need to create feelings of familiar in our discourse in order to persuade people that what we are saying is true. Let's go back to Shakespeare, because he was quite good on this stylish speech-making stuff. Let's look at the speech of Marcus Antonius in Act 3, Scene 1 of the tragedy of Julius Caesar. It's a speech you may have come across. It begins, friends, Romans, country, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives on after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. I want you to focus, ladies and gentlemen, on the very first three words. Friends, Romans, countrymen. Now, I never imagined, as Marcus Antonius took centre stage, that the friends were over here, the Romans in the middle, and the countrymen here. Did you? Is he talking to one group of people? I think so. But he's ultimately trying to appeal to their emotional register on three different levels. Friends, because if you are my friends, you will believe what I say. You will trust me implicitly. There is already an emotional register there. Romans, you, citizens of Rome, Listen to me, a citizen of Rome, because what is good for me is de facto good for you. Countrymen, my kith and my kin, through an accident of birth and geography, I imagine I share some common bond with you, some reason that leads us all to the same goal. So he's appealing to the same group of people and trying to on three different levels. He's very, very effective. Not just because Shakespeare says he is, but because of the way Marcus Antonius <coughs> uses language in that speech. If I were to come up to you and say, hello, I'm from Samsung, and I'd like to tell you all about our fantastic new mobile phone. And I go through all the applications, and your best friend, rings you up two days later and says, just bought a new phone, it's awesome, it's a Nokia. What are you more likely to go and buy, Samsung or a Nokia? <laughs> Absent any other information, because you've only got the salesman's word that the Samsung is best for. I would posit, and I'm quite happy standing by the assertion, that you'd buy the Nokia. Why? Because your friend is always more persuasive than a salesman. You have no reason to disbelieve your friend. You have no reason to doubt them. You don't think there is any other agenda in what they are saying. Your friend, you trust on the most basic level. Now, it might very well be true that your friend has just got a contract with Nokia. And built into that is a bonus structure which says, sell Nokias to all your friends. 
him. Without knowing that, you'd never have a reason to think they had anything other than your interest at heart. When Marcus Antonius says Romans, he's appealing to them on a more logical level. Not as Romans people from the city of Rome. Let's not be so narrow in our thinking. Romans means citizens of the state. If I, as a citizen of this state, claim that something is good on the basis of my citizenry, then it's automatically good for all citizens. Surely. There's a logic. The accident of birth and geography is one that we consistently find in this. The idea that because I was born on a small island somewhere off the coast of continental Europe, that I should sneer at the French, dislike the Germans because of things that happened 50 years ago, possibly have an issue with the Spanish because of the Armada in 1588, to me seems bizarre. To a lot of people, though, it's the most rational thing in the world. We all know it's not rational, but it's the most rationalised. Who here likes a sport? Ooh, quite a few. Philip, what's your favourite sport? Um. Beach yeah. Beach <laughs> Obviously different reasons. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Who here likes soccer? What's your favourite team? Munich. Bayern München. Great team. Triple European Cup winners in 74, 75 and 76 under the man known as the Kaiser, Franz Beckenbauer. They played a fantastic stadium in the Olympiastadion. It's a true joy to go and watch football there. Now, Aliona might be slightly different given that you are not a native German. But if Munich are not playing in, for example, the Champions League, <laughs> do you feel naturally drawn to support, say, Leverkusen or Dortmund because they are the German representative in the competition? As I said, maybe different because you're not a natural German. Certainly most people and most media broadcasters have this idea that their audience will support any team from that country if their own team has gone out. It's amazing when you live in England and you notice the hatred that exists between Chelsea and Arsenal, or between Manchester United and Liverpool, how many TV stations think that when Manchester United is knocked out, all the Manchester United fans will suddenly start supporting Liverpool? It's amazing how many of them think that's the case. Because of this fictional idea of nation, that we somehow share a common bond through our accident of birth and geography. And yet, I know a lot of people who were never interested in Formula One up until this season. And why did they become interested in Formula One, particularly in my country? Because Lewis Hamilton is apparently British. <laughs> I have no idea if he is. He could be as British as Obama for all I know. The fact is, though, that people see that little flag here in the corner of the screen and say, that's the guy I must cheer for. I don't like Lewis Hamilton. I'm a Ferrari fan. I like cars, not people. When cars break, you can fix them. I also, I'm a huge, huge fan of Kimi Raikkonen. But that in itself is an irrational construct. I'm only a fan of Kimi Raikkonen because I'm a fan of Helsinki and the Finnish people. Anybody who's prepared to live in that much cold and darkness deserves respect. 
They live in so much cold and darkness, they invented ski jumping as an elaborate form of suicide. <laughs> the very first person to try it just stood there, depressed at the top of a mountain. <laughs> I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Oh, here we go! And then he decided to land like that. And a whole new sport was born. But I accept that my love for fins and motor racing comes through that love of Finland. And it's completely irrational. But yet, when somebody asks me why I like Kimi Raikkonen, I don't say because I have an irrational love for the Finns. I find reasons why I think he's better than all the others. I rationalize, and I use backwards rationality. I make a decision, and then find out things that might support it on a rational level when I've never even bothered to think of them in the first place. <coughs> All human beings do that. And the moment you recognise that, you can use that as a tool of persuasion. <clears throat> do you know one of the greatest things you can ever do to persuade people that what you're saying is genuine? Yes. Stand up and speak without words. Just talk to you. Pretend that none of this is planned. I know exactly where I'm going. I've delivered this workshop several times. But the very first time I delivered this workshop, I didn't have any notes in front of me. Because one of the most unpersuasive things is if I stand there and read to you like this about all the things that I think are persuasive because this is what I've written down on my piece of paper and now I'm going to, just going to read it to the end and occasionally I look up because I've been told that eye contact is important. Um, and it's amazing how many people think that that's going to be persuasive in a debate. They write out entire arguments and then pull out a piece of paper with it on. And I think, yeah, lovely. You read very well. Have a gold star. Go to the front of the yellow bus. As Colonel Sanders might have said, your window looking good. Because reading from a page doesn't persuade anybody of any emotional content. If there is no emotional content, we choose not to buy in to a particular construct. Somebody tell me what time it is. 10.20. 10, 10, yeah. 10.20. We better finish soon. Otherwise, we won't have any time for drills. And I know that Tuna loves his drills. Not just because he's a DIY fanatic. Drill, baby, drill. There you go. <laughs> And not just because he's a fan of oil. That's not why he's saying drill, baby, drill. <laughs> but the last thing I want to leave you with, ladies and gentlemen, before I explain rocket science to you, I haven't forgotten, you see, even without notes, I can follow a structure. Crazy thought, isn't it? The last thing I want to leave you with is the ideas of the classical rhetorician. Now, the rhetoric of the ancient Greeks simply means a public speaker. I think there's a far better formulation of the term. The original term that the sophists give us, those pre-Socratic philosophers, the original philosophers, where we get the word philosophy from is from sophists. Philo sophists. See? See how that works? I love that. They used to call it logon techne, not rhetoric. Logon techne, skill with words. Because that's all that you really need to have. There are three elements of classical rhetoric. Logos, pathos, and ethos. Now I know to some of you that sounds like a tour of very, very small Greek islands. But it's not the case. Logos is what you say, but not in terms of your subject matter, in terms of your register of language, making your language accessible to your audience. 
finding a structure that you can work within, logical links between your arguments, proving analytically what you say, all the things we encourage you to do as debaters. Your pathos is your emotional content. I thought that was the where the churches were built into the mountains. No. Everybody gets that, right? <laughs> and there's Porthos and there's also Aramis, but I'm not going to talk about the other musketeers either. But Bathos. 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 Or Bathos. Bathos. Bathos is when something is banal, irrelevant. But when we use the term pathetic in modern day, we often mean banal or irrelevant rather than inspiring pathos. Your pathos is your emotional content. Your appeal to that emotional register that then makes people want to believe you. Your ethos is your standing or sitting as a person. Who you are matters when you stand up to speak. Where you derive your authority matters. In debate, that means choose examples that work. Don't stand up and say, I know this is true because Dave told me. Dave is never persuasive. As those of you who have read Dave's How to Argue, excuse me, How to Argue, you know. But when you cite a report from MIT or from Harvard, that carries with it a certain authority, a certain weight to the army. It's a difference between good public speaking and great public speaking. And it is best put by Quintilian, another of the great Roman officers. And he said, when Cicero spoke, all applauded and said what a fine speaker he was. When Demosthenes spoke, they said, now we must take arms against Philip of Macedon. That's the difference, ladies and gentlemen. Do you want applause at the end of your speech? Or do you want to arouse people to battle? Do you want to make them feel like they have to do something because of what you've told them? That's the aim. That is persuasion. That is conviction when you manage to move people to an action because they are so moved by your words. Now I did promise you that before we finish, I would teach you rocket science. So I'd like it if somebody could get a stopwatch so that we can time this. I'm just curious as to how long it takes. Wonderful. Are you ready to go? No. Oh, good. No, no, no. You start it. Okay? Start the okay. Has anybody here heard of Isaac Newton? Mm -hmm. Yes, good. What do we know about Isaac Newton? Theory of gravity? Laws of motion? Put your hand up if you don't know Isaac Newton's laws of motion. Fantastic. Everybody does. Oh, cheer up. I know them. Okay. <laughs> if everybody knows laws of motion, then I've no need to explain rocket science to you because you already know it. It's contained within the first three laws of motion. But for those of you that might not see the link, I'll explain it very, very simply. I'll explain in Newtonian terms what Newton said, and then I'll explain in everyday language what that means. Newton says the first law of motion is that any object will remain inert or travelling along a particular plane of direction unless an external force is applied upon it. But what that means is, if I don't touch that cup, it doesn't move. If I do touch that cup, and there's no such thing as friction to stop it, it will fly on forevermore. Second law of motion says that the amount of deviation from the point of inertia or from the original plane of direction is entirely dependent upon the amount of external force being applied. What that means is the harder I push the cup, the further it goes. The more resistance there is in the surface, the quicker it stops. Are we all comfortable with those two ideas? Yes, we are. Fantastic. The third law of motion is the one that everybody knows.
themselves, even if they don't know it's a law of motion. And that is that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Are we all comfortable with that idea? <coughs> That's rocket science, ladies and gentlemen. The rocket obeys the first law of motion. It remains at a point of inertia because there is no external force. We know from the third law that every force has an equal and opposite reaction, so we can reasonably posit that if we push down, our rocket will go up. The second law tells us that the amount of deviation is entirely dependent upon the amount of force. We need to create sufficient force to push down to send our rocket to the moon. Stop the clock. Time? 2.15. 2 That's not bad to explain rocket science, is it? See, the problems with rocket science are to do with what you can bust to create the sufficient energy thrust, how you contain that combustion, and the mathematics you have to do to calculate exactly what force you need to escape the Earth's gravitational pull. But all the principles of rocket science, which is what I said I would explain, are contained in those first three laws of motion. Now that hopefully illustrates that you don't need big, complicated words, grand gestures, or ranting speech in order to convince people of something, in order to explain it to them in terms that they can readily understand. Churchill said it best when he said, old words are best, short old words are best of all. Keep your language simple but not simplistic, popular but not populistic, and you will carry as many of the audience as you can on your very broad shoulders. Thank you for your attention.